may I start, Carla? Yes, please. Yeah. Good afternoon. Again, we are meeting and we are happy to gather all from our MENA area, Middle East and North Africa, with some other European countries uh, to be with us in the ABC educational courses uh, directed by our colleague and friend, Dr. Fadi Farahat. So today we are going to talk about the guidance <coughs> We'll talk about the guidance um, on the use of biosimilars in the field of oncology. Uh, now I will present our colleague, Dr. Ala Adwan. Uh, Dr. Ala Adwan is uh, the WHO Regional Director for the Eastern Mediterranean Iraq. Uh, uh, Dr. Alwan will talk. Dr. Khatib, I'm, I'm a professor. I'm not uh, now. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, clinical hematology and uh, consultant hematologist at the Monsanto University College of Medicine. Uh, uh, this was a change, yes. Uh, please, thank you. Okay, Tamam, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ala will talk about the use of substandard medicine in the region. Please, Dr. Ala, yes. the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Khatib, for this uh, nice introduction. Actually, uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, invitation. I'm very happy to be with this uh, excellent, outstanding expert uh, and uh, colleague uh, from all over the uh, Arabic world. Uh, and um, uh, I was uh, asked to be talked on the uh, substandard in, uh, and experience uh, and substandard in uh, our region. Next, please. The uh, objective of uh, this meeting is to uh, highlight the issue of use of substandard drugs in the Middle East and North Africa and to share experience with some examples of substandard in our region. Next, please. Uh, by definition, the WHO defined the substandard as a genuine medicine produced by manufacturer authorized by the national medicine regulatory authorities, which do not meet quality specifications set for them by national standard. Uh, this presents a distinct but similarly important public health problem. And uh, there is another definition by the American uh, expert enterprise for the research, which is substandard drugs are medicines made by licensed manufacturer, supposedly adhering to pharmaceutical regulatory standard, which nevertheless fail to produce the correct therapeutic effect in the patient. This is due to various causes, including basic error, such as incorrect chemical ingredient or ingredient ratios. Next, please. So if we put the substandard drugs with the other formulation of a drug like originator drug, generic drug, and counterfeit, we see that the substandard drug therapy is located between the generic and counterfeit. So it is the shady area, the gray area. And this is need more speculation for this area to be observed by the regulatory authorities. Next, please. What are the common issues with substandard therapies and the potential implication for the patient? <coughs> uh, this is, uh, we can divide this for uh, either for the, <coughs> due to active API, the active ingredient properties or drug products properties. For the first one, API, if there is high level of unknown genotoxic impurity, this will lead to potentially increase the risk of developing cancer. Maybe there is a, a risk of particularly um, uh, important in a chronic or long-term treatment. If there is a high, of un high level of unknown impurities, this will lead to interpretation of uh, interruption of, sorry, of treatment due to potentially uh, serious side effect, and impurity may be carcinogenic and it will increase uh, resistance to uh, treatment and also uh, turn a potentially uh, beneficial treatment into a failure. 
What about the drug product properties? This is uh, including uh, a poor in vitro dissolution rate, which is uh, causing ineffective treatment <coughs> and increase the resistance to treatment. Uh, and uh, the high or low content of active ingredient lead to a higher content may lead to an increased toxicity also, and also to lower content may lead to sub-therapeutic doses and effective treatment in turn. The uh, third uh, point is poor content uniformity, which lead to uh, uh, every patient, uh, every time take a pills with, with different dose, which may, this may lead to also sub-optimum uh, uh, response. Treatment may be, become less effective. <clears throat> the last point is the lack of quality consistency, which, which will include all the uh, mentioned uh, consequences of this uh, substandard therapy. Next, please. So the big uh, question is why we are seeing uh, more substandard drugs in our market. Uh, this is simply because of money, the budget. Uh, there is a health care expectation. Usually, there is a, they, they put high uh, level of expectation to uh, make the healthcare excellent. Uh, and there is a huge investment uh, which is needed to develop new medicine. Uh, so the um, government or the MOH have a limited uh, budget for these drugs, new drugs. And to compensate for this, they uh, search for other generic uh, competent drug, uh, which sometimes uh, goes into substandard, and uh, this to, to meet these expectations. And uh, to solve this problem, the generic and biosimilar formation play an essential role. But we should emphasize on this. But this must not be at the expense of the quality of a drug. Next, please. So the, there are four drug formulation, the innovator formulation, which uh, we know a lot of from data supplied to the regulator. So it is evidence-based, clinical efficacy, quality, and safety. The second one is the generic formulation, which are uh, pharmaceutical products usually intended to be interchangeable with an innovator product on formation. Uh, on bioequivalence and the clinical efficacy based on innovator data. The substandard formulation, our subject, have a national medicine regulatory authority approval, but do not meet the national or international quality standard. So the purchaser or specified rely on the innovator data. The falsified or fake medicine or counterfeit there is no data on manufacturer efficacy and it is illegal. Next, please. So as we mentioned before, uh, this substandard drug uh, may contain a wrong dose, wrong uh, IPI, it may contain impurities causing infection, uh, toxicity, cancer, failed to treat the, uh, the uh, disease and an increased chance of resistance. Next, please. So, to take home message from this section is not all drugs are created equal. Manufacturer in a poor part of the, or, uh, of the world commit uh, a, a obvious and major production flaws so serious that many of these products fail even uh, the most basic quality control test. As a first step, it is important that the regulatory authorities of these countries test what is on the market and remove the many substandard products they will find. Next, please. So, I would like to share with you some of the clinical studies that has been done and published uh, about the substandard drugs. Uh, we have two studies from uh, here, from Iraq, one from Baghdad, and um, from my center, and other from the north of Iraq in Sulaymaniyya. Uh, and the first one is published in Leukemia Lymphoma 2014. Uh, it is uh, on the prospective single uh, central study of chronic uh, myeloid leukemia uh, in chronic phase switching from brand 
uh, imitating to a copy. And uh, uh, the other one is by Dr. Khoshnau et al, published in uh, Journal Cancer of Therapy in 2014 also, about the uh, cytogenetic response in chronic myeloid leukemia. These, both, both this study concluded that there is a clear differences in a clinical efficacy between the brand form of imatinib and genic form, which in two brackets is the substandard. This is supported by the significant differences in hematological cytogenetic response among different groups with significant higher response rate between the brand group. Bioclivalence, pharmacovigilance, and cost effective study needed to be evaluated for a generic or copy product before it can be administered. Also, a proper a clinical trial is indicated to ensure good drug quality, patient safety, and determine the clinical efficacy. Next, please. Next, please. This is the, uh, the, the summary of this study. Next, please. Other published data, uh, including from uh, Egypt and from uh, Morocco and from Algeria and uh, from the Lebanon and also in Iran, all these uh, studies has shown that there is a clear uh, differences between the brand and the substandard drugs. And all these point to we should uh, make uh, a precise choosing for this drug and put this drug into uh, the uh, into the uh, governmental authorities like the uh, committee for uh, choosing this drug uh, according to the international uh, regulatory like the FDA or EMEA. Next, please. So the home message for this section, home message two, international and regional efforts are required to compact the distribution of low quality medicine and having a strong national drug regulatory agency is essential to achieve this goal. Next, please. What about the economic and social impact of substandard drugs? As we know that the uh, substandard drugs, uh, depending on the scope of those affected by disease, the substandard drug treatment can affect many people. The incidence of substandard drug in developing country is estimated in about uh, 37%. Also, the substandard drug is now is a problem in the developed country. They are gradually entering a legitimate drug supply chain, although the exact scale of the problem is still difficult to determine. So when the innovator company uh, discover a new molecule, they put in their mind that this molecule should be good enough, uh, having good response to make this patient uh, getting a better life with minimal or no complication. While the substandard drugs, when we use these uh, drugs, it will lead in considerable cases to hospital admission because of ineffective uh, response to treatment, and it even may, the patient may go to, into uh, other complications like septicemia, etc. So there will be a burden on doctors, nurses, lab technicians, blood banking, etc. This is a regard of uh, in hematology. And uh, it, the, th those patients will consume other treatment to compact these uh, complications like antibiotic, antifungal, antiviral. So there is a huge budget uh, to, to, uh, to save this patient and um, get rid of this complication. Also, there will be occupation of the ICU bed and uh, different type of investigation imaging technique. So a huge burden on the uh, health system budget. Next, please. Next, please. Yes. So there, is a, there was a, a study uh, done by the uh, Bottoman et al. in which uh, they make a modeling survival for these drugs, the seven standard drugs, in comparison with the brand one. Uh, they found that using of the same model to project the overall survival among patients treated with imatinib could result in uh, 11 patients additional year. 
So accounting for both disease progression and the quality of life, patients on the originator medicine were predicted to experience 13.4 quality adjusted life year, while patients on a copy therapy could expect just 1.429 quality of life therapy. There is a big difference. So in the region, next please, yes. Uh, in a region where uh, cost matter collection and availability of data on cost of complication, disease relapse, hospitalization, uh, associated with the use of the standard drug may also aid the government in budget consideration when a decision on approval of generic are being made or revisited. In fact, recent review of 40 study concluded that the use of generic do not always lead to cost saving, with 67% of a study showing that the, constitution, the substitution of two generic had no significant difference in a clinical outcome, and 64% showing that generic use actually there will be an increased cost of these drugs. Next, please. So the home message three, the use of substandard drug can have an enormous and big economic impact on the patient and health system. So next, please. This is my conclusion. And at the conclusion, I uh, took it from uh, the paper, uh, which is uh, uh, published um, by the collaboration of, um, uh, with our colleague from the Arab world. Uh, and uh, this conclusion uh, says that regulatory authority in the Middle East region carry responsibilities to ensure generic drug come through internationally accepted quality standard and undergo appropriate bioequivalence testing before reaching patients. The second one, overall, healthcare costs should be considered and value should come before price of a generic. Number three, appropriate pharmacovigilance and reporting system need to be in a place for a generic safety monitoring and should rely on collaborative effort between physician, pharmacist, and even a patient. Number four, education on drug quality matters should target all stakeholders, starting with patients and physicians who can then transmit their knowledge and voice to ensure adequate awareness to the concern and to upgrade existing regulation as needed. And finally, Although our call to action was prompted by observation in our clinical practice in hematology, we extend a recommendation to a colleague from other specialties for similar situation assessment and to share their experience. And with this, I thank you very much. And this is a picture of Mustansariya um, uh, School, the old one. Uh, and thank you very much. And I'm ready for any question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ala, and thank you to stick for the time. Now I will present Dr. Hind Radhi as a panelist to uh, chair all the session now mm -hmm. with the other panelists. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ahlan, Dr. Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ahlan, Dr. Muhammad. You are not going to join us. أنا مين الآن؟ أنا جاي أهو بدري أهو كمان برضو. أنا قلت لهم أنا قلت لهم مش معقول الدكتور محمد هيك. You are welcome, Dr. Muhammad. So I will present Dr. Hind Mrabiti, consultant medical oncologist at Muhammad the Fifth University. Dr. Hind, السلام عليكم. عليكم السلام عليكم دكتور عبد الله. رفادي صديق العزيز كيف حالك؟ الله يخليك يا رب شكرا. عليه. Dr. Hind. رفلي أنا أكون موجود معك. الله يخليك. Dr. Hind. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Fadi Farhat uh, and, uh, and uh, for their me. invitation. And excuse I have me. the. Okay. Uh, I, am, I am in my office now. Uh, uh, you have your presentation now. Uh, now, 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 now. Right. Just okay. two minutes, and I will be with you. <laughs> So we can take the question. It's okay. Yes, we, we can, can perhaps uh, discuss the first uh, presentation. Yes, yes, Doctor. Uh, it's okay. I'm 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 five and a half. Five and a half. I'll be ready with you. Okay. 
Okay. Yes, okay. I guess we may Thank have you. 10 10 minutes for for discussion regarding Dr. Alwan uh, talk. Uh, initially, I guess we may take uh, questions from the audience. If not, uh, I have some points to comment. Okay. Any, okay. any questions from uh, the audience? No, there is no question. Uh, well, uh, would like, if you would like to present uh, Dr. Ahmed Yunus. Uh, it's fine. It's fine, Dr. Khatib. It's fine. I, I will proceed with a question to Dr. Uh, Alwan. Fadi, uh, what do you I will present you. Dr. Ahmed Yunus is a medical oncologist and he is the head of the department uh, of the, in the military hospital, Department of Hematology Oncology. He's well, well, uh, yani, uh, knowledgeable in oncology and even in, in, in cost analysis, so which is very important to this debate. And I'm happy to have this discussion because uh, today, uh, today's talk is about biosimilars, but we are starting from the root of the problem, which is the substandard treatment. So as Dr. Ala mentioned, we had, a, we had a paper together talking about the quality, but the initial problem is the quality. So that is the issue. And at the same time, the cost is very important. So we have here two representatives of the, the insurers, Dr. Ahmed Yunis and Dr. Elin Bakhazi. So I hope the debate will be hot today. So yalla, it's, it's your turn, Dr. Ahmed Yunis, my friend. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Fadi, uh, for this uh, nice uh, producing me. Um, I, I just want to ask Dr. Uh, Alwan uh, regarding the substandard imatinib. You raised very, very important uh, issue here because you presented many uh, uh, papers regarding a failure of of, uh, of substandard imatinib, for example. Um, if we may know the source of uh, these drugs uh, and the cost, actually. Uh, first, because um, uh, for me personally, I am, uh, I guess, happy that uh, I didn't have the chance to use a substandard uh, drug because we have very strict uh, regulatory approvers in our institution. We only use the FDA, EMEA approved the drugs and even the generics and so on. Um, so uh, we may have the, your experience in such uh, uh, practice using the substandard uh, imatinib because, you know, we, we, we've used uh, imatinib for the last 15, 20 years uh, with a cost five or six thousand dollars per month. And uh, then we realized that the cost of producing a metanib is only $150, you know. So uh, if, if you may tell us regarding the source of these substandard drugs and the cost. You are unmute, you must unmute yourself. Dr. Alwan, please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Okay. 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 You hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so in uh, 2009, um, we, uh, the, the, there is uh, uh, there was a brand uh, the the uh, imatinib from the start from the 2003 till 2009 in which uh, the government. Um, uh, out of sudden, they uh, make a deal with uh, an Indian company uh, and they bringing this uh, uh, copy of uh, imatinib, which is called, uh, called uh, imatis, uh, is from Sipla, and the cost was uh, about one hundred um, dollar for uh, one month per one month, uh, and uh, it was um, at that time they make uh, a noise that is a perfect uh, deal and we are saving money from uh, this. At that time, the, uh, uh, the brand one of artists was uh, about 1,600 uh, for the one month. 
so uh, it is making a huge uh, saving for the Ministry of Health. But uh, when uh, we use this uh, treatment, uh, and we must use this treatment because um, may, uh, you may know that the um, uh, Iraqi uh, Minister of Health is giving the drug uh, free of charge for all patients. Uh, so the patient is, have no way, they, uh, if they can afford to buy from outside, they will buy from outside, the, the uh, brand one. If they cannot, they should use this uh, treatment. So we uh, observe that uh, some patients getting uh, many um, side effects uh, and uh, some of them transform from uh, chronic phase to accelerated, even to blood crisis, we have a death. And, uh, and this, uh, 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 this is in, in Baghdad, we have three centers and uh, all the centers, uh, same uh, observation and also in the north, then uh, in the north, uh, they were uh, they were using the uh, this copy before uh, Baghdad in 2006 and seven and eight. But because they are not uh, in in, uh, in relation to the uh, government, they can bring the uh, uh, the, the copy uh, on their uh, cost. So uh, we collect these uh, cases in, in our uh, study, there was uh, 126 patients and we lost four patients, uh, unfortunately, and uh, about uh, 36 patients transformed to accelerated phase. So it was a tragedy because of uh, this uh, uh, outcome, a very, very poor outcome. And we uh, immediately after uh, uh, six months, of use, we give a report to the Ministry of Health, uh, to the Pharmacovigilance uh, Committee. They uh, terminate this contract with the, this uh, company, and uh, as usual, uh, it uh, uh, for uh, this uh, because of corruption at that time. Uh, uh, Dr. So Alwan, uh, yeah. just a question. Do you have yes. data on uh, hematological response or yes. e even yes. if, if anybody had, uh, had a deep molecular response in such a drug? Yes. No, no. Uh, on uh, on uh, a copy, uh, there was a very, um, um, I, I, I think there was no uh, deep molecular response at all. Deep molecular response, no. But, so uh, it's a big but, failure. This is yes, a disastrous yes, yes. drug. Yes, but uh, in hematological, yes, but there was no cytogenetic, no uh, molecular. Yes. There is a question from the audience. Uh, it's about the next, uh, uh, the next speech. It's about the difference between biosimilars and generics. There is a question if the presentation was on the use of generics. No, it's a, it's a presentation about substandards that are not generics and are not uh, biosimilars. So uh, I think... Uh, I'm ready. Yeah, you are ready, yes. Dr. Abdullah will uh, answer to this question. It's a question from the audience about the okay. difference between them. Uh, okay. So we can... Okay. We can uh, continue with uh, Dr. Abdullah. So I have the pleasure to introduce him. It's Dr. Mohamed Abdullah. He's professor of clinical oncology at Cairo University. And he will speak about academic oncology clinicians' understanding of biosimilars. Okay. Thank you, Professor Marat Prati, for your kind introduction. And uh, at the same time, uh, I am really honored to be with you. Thanks, Professor Sami. Uh, our dear friend, and we are sharing a lot of events together. Dr. Fadi, thank you very much for your kind invitation for me. Uh, during the next few minutes, I'm going to emphasize the concept of biosimilar. Why it is different while not different. It's something new to our practice as clinical. This is me and this is my disclosures. Before I proceed to my presentation, uh, actually research, science, and finance are all coupled together. They have a unique bond because if we want to have good research to yield good products and good drugs, usually we need a lot of funds to make this possible. And when we look to the global 
uh, biggest industries uh, all over the world and about the revenue expected for the year 2020. We will find that the global health and health insurance carriers, health systems in general, is number one regarding the revenue from uh, uh, investing in this industry. Second, when we look to the industrial market by itself, we have usually the big tycoons and the smaller companies. But here is a list of the biggest multinational mother companies. Why? Because they are getting the best and highest revenue. But first of all, why they are considered as the big and mother companies? Because a lot of things. They are first much concerned with the research and development of pharmaceuticals because they are seeking for innovative products, innovative molecules, improve the landscape of disease control in general. Second, also they are seeking for perfection. They need something to be useful, safe, not hazardous, not harming the uh, the, the, the human being, health, general health, from the adverse events and, and, and others. Because of this is a big industry, it's usually trusted, dynamic, and growing. They are inventing and innovating and exploring new era in the treatments. And since usually there is a great bond between finance, research, and science, this will be reflected on the stock market. We will find that the big pharma companies, usually, they are sharing much in the stock marketing. The major difference that they are not looking to control the symptoms of the disease. They are looking to control the cause, the brain of the disease, the backstage of disease where we have a lot of molecular events encountered and blamed in the backstage of disease responsible for its aggressiveness and its resistance also to the available agents. While other companies usually will go for just symptomatic to improve, for example, the pain, to improve the, the gastric upset, but it's not tackling the brain of the disease. And when we look to cancer, in a specific, we have a triad of events controlling the disease process, which is apoptosis, the, 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 the immune system of the body and how it will deal with the new invader, although it arises from inside the body, and the concept of angiogenesis. Control the disease globally, you are going to tackle the apoptosis resistance usually present with the immortal cellular cancerous clone, and how this clone is smart enough to evade the immune system, and then how it will control its life cycle and behave as a new organ inside the body through the development of its own blood supply, the process of angiogenesis. So, we are talking about biologics, because if we want to tackle certain events biologically, our approach should be through a biologic weapon. So, biologics, in by definition, usually it's a monoclonal antibody. It's obtained from a living organism, it's either from bacteria or from animal cells or even from the human cells develop hormones, vaccines, and monoclonal antibodies. And this definitely requires a very long time of research and development than before approval to be used for the treatment of the human being. And at the same time, they are going to have much clinical trials worldwide to see that suitable for all ethnics or not. So it means that by the end of the day, and they are going to spend a lot of money. This money will be reflected upon the price of the drug. 
At the same time, the developing venting pharmaceutical should have certain time to get the reward, to get the benefit of what they invented into the market. This period is usually known as the patent period or the patency of the drug, which is usually around 20 years. After this 20 years, we have the opportunity to develop another drug, identical or nearly identical to the original one, known as biosimilar. This is not generic, it's biosimilar. And it's highly similar to the copies of the existing biological monoclonal antibody or the originators that will work in the same fashion. What's really important that the approval process for the biosimilars be approved definitely. It is not different than the process for the originator or the monoclonal antibody or the original agent or pharmaceutical. It will follow the same steps and the same action. Here is a summary of the direction of how can we approve a biosimilar. First, this is the phase of the analytical studies, which is usually the most lengthy procedure because the inventing biosimilar should have the know-how to have the biosimilar, to have a drug that's nearly the same as the original one. So they spent a lot of time in the psychochemical and biologic, physiochemical and biologic characterization of the agent. Then moving to the less lengthy periods of investigations through the non-clinical validation. Non-clinical validation, usually this is the phase of the animal studies that this drug is safe, studying the pharmacokinetics and dynamics well, the immune reaction that's going to be also validated in further studies on human beings. And this is the shortest time because we have the experience from the original or the originator through many trials. So here we are not in need to have such lengthy period of investigations. We can do it just for one phase three trial to say that our product is identical to the originator. Also, we talk about generics, and we had this just question, as Marathi has just said before the start of my presentation. Generics is completely different to similars. Why? Because it's just identical copies of simple medicine, simple product, very simple structure. It is not a biologic structure. So when a company will go for the generic as for paracetamol, for example, for proofing, for any antibiotic, the, the, the manufacturer, which is the, 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 uh, one of the big pharma, it will ensure the good quality definitely at a competitive cost as it will not go for uh, further clinical evaluation or clinical trials. This will provide the daily living penis for the pharma industry to be able to live and to gain benefit and to conduct much more research in the field of biosimilars. Again, all of this will go for the patient satisfaction mode. They have to satisfy the, our patients regarding all of the above mentioned points, regarding the quality and the cost and effectiveness. So to make it clear, what about, what is the difference, the major differences between biologics and seminars and they should be grouped because they were developed in the same fashion and having the same guidelines for commercial approval in the market versus the symbol chemical drugs or generics. First, go for example like acetylsalicylic acid, 
look to the molecular weight, 180 Daltons, while for the biologic monoclonal antibody, whatever, metoclamab or whatever, around or more than 150,000 Daltons. It's a very small size in case of generic. It's very large for the biosimilar. And it's well characterized and simple for the chemical because every one tablet will be the same like the original one. While in the biosimilar, the complex structure will lead to many possibilities of both translational modification. Again, we are dealing with biological agent. So, regarding the manufacturing process, we have a predictable pathway, while for the biosimilar, still we will have some differences because every living cell line will have a definite, different in the product, but not in the core. The other things that we are going to show. Generics usually fully characterized, while it's more difficult to characterize fully the, the uh, biologic or the monoclonal antibodies. Structure of the chemical agent is relatively stable for longer time, while, as we are talking about, the biologic material usually sensitive to storage and and the, 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 the validity period is usually less than the generic agents. Finally, being chemical and well studied and predicted what, what response is going to evoke, is associated with lower potential of inducing immunogenic response, while for the biologics and biosimilars, definitely we should expect higher immunogenic potential. Again, it's the fact of the cost. FDA had defined the biosimilars strictly as a biologic product, highly similar, and has no clinically meaningful differences from any existing, previously existing FDA approved reference product in terms of safety, purity, well for potency. And it will have been have identical amino acid sequence to their reference or originator product. The only difference would be in the final uh, characterization as the 3D structure, glycosylation sites, isoform profiles, and protein aggregation. And also, they should have the same therapeutic indications, mechanism of action, the route of administration. We should be talking about formula and then to talk about a biosimilar to be given orally. This is not a biosimilar. It should be also given as or administered as the primary one. The dosage and strength as the reference to growth should be identical. So the biosimilar is not a bio better, definitely. We are going to have a molecule which is known to us for example, any of our updated agents or biological agents like rituximab, trastuzumab, or uh, uh, cetuximab, baritumumab. Usually, the biosimilar should be identical. We are not allowed to have any improvement to the molecule because it has developed by another manufacturer. You cannot go at a later step to join. The, the platform of uh, manufacturing. Also, it is not a biomimic or biocopy because they have not evaluated according to similar roles for the biosimilar production. Again, the generic drug, as we have seen, it's something else. It's very simple, identical to the original drug. Structure is, is, can be easily characterized. At the same time, it is not a biologic. It's just a chemical uh, formula. So, 
why we are talking about biosimilars? What are the opportunities of having similar? Definitely, as we said before, the original company or the original developer will spend much years in the research and the development than moving to the pharma items like the pharmacodynamics, kinetics, and finally go for the, the, the value of adding this biosimilar to certain therapeutic platform through improving, for example, the survival outcome, the response rate, to free or disease-free survival. While for the company developing the biosimilar, it will not pass through all of this tedious procedure. So it will spend much less money. This means that we can have additional treatment options of the same efficacy for a lower price, and this will direct our resources to be redistributed or to be responsible for financing other research and improving our own products or developing our own products. It's clear. For this to be appreciated more, if we are going to compare the price of the biosimilar or the cost of the biosimilar in relation to the primary logic originator, it will be not less than 30% less than the reference product. If we are going to, 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 to more apparent in a sum of money, National health system that they expect have lowering of the cost of the health services by using biosimilars in addition to originators, they will save about 210 million British pounds. In US language, they are expecting to have 9 to 12 billion. USD as a saving from the Medicare system during the next decade from approving the biosimilar to be used in the market. But still, it's, it's very good to have a biosimilar, but still we have a lot of challenges. It is not an easy business. First, the immunogenicity. Well, we have a minor variant as we are dealing with a biologic or monoclonal antibody, and this minor variant will be countered during the process of the medical So we might have more or less immunogenic. Uh, also, we might expect it to have more development of anti drug antibodies leading to increasing the half life time and the process of neutralization of the agents. At least one clinical trial is able to detect genesis differences between originator and biosimilar. Looking to the process of development of the biosimilar and how the FDA is going to approve as well as the EMA also. When we go to this pyramid on the right cartoon, sided cartoon, going from down upward, the first phase is to have the original molecule. This definitely will uh, be, will, ex will, will take about a very long time to achieve this, to have the purified and similar molecule. Then moving to the process of animal studies, it will be less than the originator, as we said, and it will be tested in the animal model for the pharmacodynamics and the kinetics. Moving to the clinical pharmacology and starting Dr. to Dr. Abdullah, we're getting, uh, you know, um, running out of time. Uh, can you please uh, be faster a little bit? Okay, sir. Finally, the process is decreasing in time from the onset of development till to be allowed for the commercial use. And when we compare it to the biosimilar development, you can notice the difference that for the original, starting from the analytical characterization, very, very short period, 
versus very long one in the biosimilar. And as we go up, the time is increasing, while for the biosimilar, as we go up, the time will decrease. Moving to another uh, concept for the use of the biosimilars, which is the extrapolation based on our knowledge, the original one. After the development of the biosimilar and its approval, we'll go for the clinical trial to test one of the primary indications of the original one. And if we achieve it, we can extrapolate other indications that were not tested in the biosimilar clinical trial, but assuming that the original can do it, so the biosimilar will be able to do it. Then the, the equivalence, the, 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 the biosimilar should be equivalent to the originator. So we don't go for superiority or non-inferiority studies. We go for equivalence study, not inferior, and it is not superior anymore. And usually by FDA and EMA, we have borders for this to be tested through equations. We have margins for the differences. It's not superior, it should not be inferior. Then the, the, the interchangeability, the concept of interchangeability or switching. If we do have the originator and we started treatment for certain patient with certain indication, at some time you can go and interchange with a biosimilar or to switch it from the start if it is available in your practice. Finally, the pharmacovigilance, which is concerned with the safety of the broad. So it's a very tedious process, very lengthy one, but at the same time, it's very efficient because we have the quality, the same good quality for a lower price. And this definitely is the job of the big pharma. Finally, there is a growing awareness and the interest of biosimilars now, and we have many opportunities allowing us to reallocate our resources or improving our health services. Biosimilars are approved after confirming the totality of the evidence, extrapolation of other indications other than that tested in the biosimilar trial, but definitely achieved by the originator. It emphasizes the concept of switching and interchangeability. Priority to be considered. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for exceeding the time. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah, for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I think that you answered to the first uh, question, uh, the difference between biosimilars and generics. There is also another question. Do we expect a product approved by FDA and ABA a good one to use? What do you think about this question? Yes, definitely. If not good, it will not be approved. This process uh, before approving any agent. So this will follow the, the as, as, I, as I mentioned in my presentation, and definitely it will be a good one and the cheaper one at the same time without using the clinical efficacy or uh, the, the patient safety. I think that biosimilars are very important for uh, our region and for all the world to reduce uh, the cost to have the availability of, uh, of biological drugs. And uh, of course, if they follow the FDA and MEA regulatory part three, and if they are approved, it's a good point for them. But I think that uh, if they followed a good, all the steps of uh, approval, uh, we can have good biosimilars, even if they are not approved by FDA or MEA. Because I just want, I have uh, an example from our country. We have biosimilars that are not approved by FDA and MEA but uh, they followed all the regulatory, uh, all the pathway, uh, and uh, we are using them uh, since one year. We don't have any issue about uh, safety uh, or uh, efficacy, and we are doing pharmacovigilance uh, studies, and we didn't notice uh, any, uh, any differences in safety. So why they were not approved? 
I don't know if they were, they were. I don't think that they are already. Uh, they they are already. Uh, they didn't. Um, uh, they didn't give. They didn't ask FDA or MEA for the approval. They didn't ask them for the approval. Maybe on the way. Maybe on the way. Yes, may, I, on the way. On the way. Because I know that we have a lot of products coming from certain regions of the world. They, yeah. they are not uh, tested through clinical trials. Um, and I have not in Egypt because in Egypt still we don't have the seminars available yet now. But in other Arab countries, I have noticed their presence. And uh, believe me, uh, I had hard times with them while practicing with my patients. And Dr. Penny knows this very well. It's both the role of regulatory agencies and oncologists to participate to the approval because oncologists can, um, uh, can, uh, can, uh, can evaluate clinical trials. But uh, as you said, the foundation for biosimilarity is the analytical characterization. It's the most important step and this step will be better analyzed by specialists, pharmacologists and pharmacists. So uh, we must have uh, uh, specific regulations or follow FDA or MEA regulations to approve uh, these uh, biosimilars. But I think the, the, there is a great um, uh, importance of the post-market evidence, for, of the pharmacovigilance. It's very important. Uh, this step is very important to be familiar with the biosimilars and to know really their safety and efficacy. Sure, yes. Dr. Mrapt, can I, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, first of all, I would like to also welcome Dr. Amirna Matni, who is, uh, Mirna, you are the president of the ISPOR chapter in Lebanon, and uh, who is in the uh, Sécurité Sociale, uh, le leading the scientific committee. I, I, a scientific uh, committee, yeah. I want to ask you about the biosimilars. Can we call these drugs that you are using in Morocco as biosimilars since they have went through all the process but do, they do not have the FDA and MA? And for example, I know that Russia is producing yes. a product and uh, some others maybe uh, that, will, that they will have, uh, they will go through all the pathway. But the problem is, that we are following the FDA and EMA, ASCO, ESMO, and CCN guidelines uh, for therapeutic decision. Uh, shouldn't we follow also the same uh, rules? I understand very well that there is a political, let's say some political issue. Russia will never submit their product to the FDA or to the EMA even. And maybe they are right, maybe they are wrong, I don't know. And China probably will not do the same. So. Is it a, it's a question of politi politics. So how, it's a question for everybody in the audience. How do you think we should, we should run uh, this, uh, this problem? Why in our country you are asking about quality? It's just because, because we have a local problem of control. We are not really confident in our, in our local control because we have an economical problem. So I think uh, the session is just to uh, is is mainly to uh, to make us understand what's happening about generics and biosimilars, uh, substandard drugs and biocopies first, and to ask ourselves and to try to design a strategy for the future. So again, how do you think we will deal with these drugs, uh, bio? biosimilars or biocopy that are not FDA EMA approved? If they tell you that they will not seek for approval, what will you do, Dr. Ahend, and uh, for all my colleagues? Uh, I think uh, we, must, um, we must analyze the clinical studies from our side as uh, oncologists. And uh, for all, after this approval, uh, it was mandatory to do pharmacovigilance study. It's our role. Uh, it was a conditional approval. They, they, they gave them the approval and the condition was to perform 
after that for the first biosimilar for example for the trastuzumab biosimilar uh, one that was approved the clinical study was done in metastatic breast cancer and we know for for example for trastuzumab the, the study must, made, must be performed in the neoadjuvant setting it's the most sensitive population, for example, for breast cancer. So we ask them to do a neoadjuvant study to approve the, 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 the biosimilar. So it's very important that uh, specialists can, uh, can evaluate the, the analytical characterization. It's difficult for oncologists to do it. So we have a regulatory agency with pharmacists working on that. And to uh, interpret clinical uh, trials, it's our role uh, to know what is the most sensitive uh, population, the most sensitive endpoint, and to, uh, to have to, to put the condition to have a, a post-approval uh, study. It's a condition to, uh, to have the final approval. It's a conditional approval. Um, I, I do appreciate what Professor Marabti had just mentioned. Also, I do appreciate well what Professor Farahat had mentioned for this uh, issue. But uh, uh, um, let me uh, to be somewhat weird or skeptical about uh, the issue of having an agent while not approved. Let me ask you the question. Definitely from Russia, they are not ready to seek for FDA approval. This is a political A biosimilar coming from other countries. I'm not going to specify any country. Okay? But if you are confident, sure about your product you can go for the approval because this will open more and more markets for you this is an economic game as i have seen you for the first two slides why we are classifying the pharma companies to be one of the mother and multinational companies why not for the others because they have the know-how, they have the facility. You are going to have a biosimilar from a company with history in the manufacturing of the biosimilars. Definitely, the monoclonal. They are aware of the concept of the monoclonal. Strict program and for the quality control and quality control assurance. For me, I don't find a logic reason for anyone, if he is well confident in his product, to go and uh, having the FDA approval. Dr. Sami, I, th I think we have the, the, the Hekma company, which is an Arab company, right? And it's approved in the US. I I'm not going into the, the, the background, the political background, but they are sure of what they have. If you are not going to accept the, 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 the major regulatory uh, procedures, so yeah, I, I cannot tell that you have to continue. No. If not, I will be in doubt. Right? Um, there is another question from the audience uh, about the difference. Uh, what uh, what is the main difference in terms of major disadvantage between biosimilar and generics? I think that you already explained uh, uh, that you already answered to this question. Okay, and the two thinking issues: biosimilar is something, generic is another. Thing. Completely different. Uh, it's also uh, the, the, the next question. Is, what about your experience with Indian drugs in Egypt? No comment. <laughs> so it is negative. Clear, clear, clear answer. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry to say so. I'm not seeking to spend a lot of money, but also I am caring. If I am the patient, I will not be accepted. I will not accept. Yes, yes, yes. It's clear. Can, can I know I that Dr. Samuel, question? I know Dr. Fadi, maybe he's not, like, he's not liking what I'm saying or is not commented by 
the concept of that it, we should have a big pharma budget for this. Uh, Dr. Hennet, I guess uh, Dr. Fadi and uh, Dr. Mirna uh, will have uh, nice talks about uh, biosimilars. So uh, if we may proceed, then we continue the discussion after yes. uh, their talks, please. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. Hey, just first, thank let you. me thank Dr. Fadi uh, for presenting me, inviting me. I guess it's uh, really uh, very interesting to have this multidisciplinary uh, talk, uh, having the perspective of the peer and the academician and the onco, uh, and uh, I guess we'll have the, the discussion at the end. Thank you. We'll introduce the next speaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Ahend, would you like to present, to introduce the... Okay, I'm the one who will present, okay. So uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, uh, Midna Metni. She's controller pharmacist. Uh, she's uh, working at the medical control department at the National Se Social Security Fund in Beirut. And she will uh, speak about biosimilars development and regulatory requirements. The session is about biosimilar development and regulatory requirements. Well, it, in 15 minutes, it's very difficult to talk about these two important um, topics and to cover everything, but I promise that I will try as much as possible to focus on important messages and key points to remember. And in order to understand how uh, biosimilars are produced, uh, we have first to know that biologics have a very complex manufacturing process and that um, uh, the, uh, every single little change in the manufacturing process will impact safety and efficacy of biotherapeutic products. And uh, we will define together the comparability exercises needed to assess those changes. Now, what about the manufacturing process for biologics? And as you all know, biologics are produced by genetically modified living cells in a complex biotechnological process, like, for example, the monoclonal antibodies, whereas small molecules chemically synthesized uh, will go through a series of chemical reactions. And uh, this uh, manufacturing process can be reproduced, in fact, leading to identical end product, what we call a generic product. So what we have to remember in one sentence that biologics are much larger and more complex than chemically synthesized small molecule drugs. This is uh, the illustration we used 10 years ago and we are still using it and we love it so much because it can clearly show us the difference between the small molecule drugs having an average of 20 to 30 atoms, whereas um, a monoclonal antibody uh, huge molecules used in, in oncology specifically will have an average of 25,000 to 30,000 atoms, making the difference between the manufacturing of uh, a small bike and a huge airplane. And if I have to ask you about the most complex class of biologics, so it's of course monoclonal antibodies, um, the huge ones and uh, look at the structure. It's very complicated. And what we have to know is that all parts will contribute to the efficacy and safety in a cooperative way. And as we have uh, said before, the manufacturing process is highly complex. And it includes um, first the cloning of the gene of interest into DNA plus meat vector and then expression of the vector in a suitable host cell line, 
large scale production, protein isolation and extensive and numerous purification steps, and finally, formulation and packaging of the final product. Now, what we have to know is that each step in the process can affect the properties of the biologic, which can result in, for example, batch to batch variations and difficulty in achieving reproducibility. And the manufacturing process for biologics needs seriously to be controlled in order to ensure, as we said before, product stability and quality. And now that we have seen how um, biologics are manufactured in a very complex way, what are the impacts of changing in the manufacturing process at different levels? So why manufacturers are doing some um, changes? in the manufacturing of a biologic, for example. We have several reasons. Um, first, to improve product quality, so making it better, for example, um, uh, uh, changing a, a, a certain purification step. Second, to improve manufacturing efficiency, uh, need to change, for example, the site of production, or due to some regulatory commitments uh, at a national or international level. Changes in the manufacturing process can occur at various stages in the product life cycle. So as we, seen, as we have just seen from, from a change of a new excipient, for example, to a change of a new cell line. But what is important to know is that every single change in the manufacturing process will have an impact, a serious impact on clinical safety and efficacy. That's why every single change that will occur needs to be monitored and assessed later on. Important key message to always remember that any building block count and even a small change may impact the biologics efficacy and safety. And because changes can occur in the manufacturing process at different levels, then comparability exercises are needed in order to assess the impact of those changes. What are those comparability exercises and what are data requirements? So we're going to see together. By definition, the comparability exercise will assess the impact of manufacturing process changes. Now we want to see that this change, if this change will have an impact on the quality of the product, uh, the safety and the efficacy of the biologics. So the, this change of excipient of this or this change of the uh, uh, manufacturing site, uh, will it influence or impact uh, those uh, parameters? Uh, and that's why we need the comparability exercise. In some cases, this comparability exercise will, uh, will need only a simple analytical testing, but, but in other cases, uh, this comparability exercise will need non-clinical and clinical data that have uh, to be submitted by the manufacturer, and this is uh, serious and costly for the manufacturer. The nature and extent of the change will define the amount and type of data necessary to evaluate comparability. And that's uh, what we are going to see in the table below. And here is a summary of the um, potential comparability requirements needed uh, based on the uh, nature of the process changes. So if we look at it and we see that um, a new excipient is added or modified, uh, in the biologic, so at, the, at, at this point, uh, the company um, has to uh, provide uh, re regulatory departments with analytical testing uh, showing uh, the safety efficacy and quality of the product also, and extended in vitro functional testing has to be provided also, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamics, toxicity in animals as well and uh, as in human also. So a huge work to be done uh, only but uh, for uh, the change of uh, the excipient it in itself. And uh, now what is important to uh, mention about the uh, biosimilar um, development is that the biosimilar starts with a new cell line. And if we look at the potential comparability requirement at this stage, um, at the end, uh, whenever a new cell line is there, uh, so uh, the company has to provide uh, basically, the analytical testing, the extended in vitro functional testing, but also the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic toxicity studies in animals, 
in animals as well as in additional clinical trials, safety data required, and that we are going to see in the regulation part in the second part of the presentation. Now, the development of biosimilars will rely on the comparability studies with the reference biologic to show very high similarity, so similar quality, similar efficacy, and similar safety. The regulatory requirements for demonstrating this biosimilarity uh, will be now discussed in the second part, knowing that the requirements are mostly similar to the process we have just seen in the comparability exercise whenever a change is made in the manufacturing process. Moving now to the regulatory requirements, we'll start uh, by the main regulatory guidelines, specifically FDA and DEMA, uh, very briefly then tackling the second part of non-clinical and clinical data required, which makes the difference uh, with chemical products, and will end up by the immunogenicity issue of biotherapeutic products. What are the main regulatory guidelines? Now, the first biosimilar regulatory guidelines were developed by Europe in 2005, and then uh, uh, it was updated in 2015, uh, the first biosimilar was approved in Europe in 2006. In 2009, the WHO biosimilar guidelines were released based mostly on uh, the European guidelines. And at the same time, the Japanese released the biosimilar guidelines. Canadian followed in 2010. In 2012, the FDA issued the first draft guidance on biosimilar uh, officially approved in 2015 with the first biosimilar approved. Now, uh, we see that while uh, most of uh, those countries, Europe, uh, US, Can Canada, uh, Australia, and Japan, uh, have really very restrictive and transparent and clear guidelines on biosimilars, we see that in other countries, those guidelines are uh, less restrictive, and in some uh, other less developed countries, those guidelines don't exist at all. This is to say that uh, EMA uh, or Europe issued not only general guidelines or detailed guidelines on quality clinical and non-clinical guidelines, but also EMA issued guidelines, product class specific guidelines. So um, guidelines for the monoclonal antibodies, guidelines for interference, so this is a really different and some other specifications uh, uh, are included in a class and not in another. As well, FDA issued um, general guidance on quality, safety, efficacy, but not only general guidance, some principles and procedures uh, on biologics price competition, guidance for industry, and all are published on the FDA website, Biologics and Biosimilars. Now moving to the non-clinical and clinical data required. Now for the manufacturer to establish biosimilarity, uh, some important data have to be presented to the government or to the regulatory agency. Physicochemical, biological characterization, non-clinical, clinical pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic data, proving clinical efficacy, safety, as well as immunogenicity, very important parameter we're gonna discuss at the end of the presentation. And all of this assessing differences to reference products. So no uh, significant differences has, have to be uh, shown. And uh, especially uh, with those small differences showing potential impact on safety efficacy. So if there is um, uh, a, a significant uncertainty there, at this time, the product won't be named a biosimilar and won't be given an approval from the regulatory agency. So to demonstrate biosimilarity, uh, this is an interesting illustration showing the inverted totality of evidence uh, with, with a focus on the analytical characterization, which is more for biosimilar development, and last clinical studies up. Uh, so here we can see that analytical characterization will show uh, the, um, the quality, it will ensure the quality of the product. The non-clinical will test uh, in vivo toxicology in animals. Clinical pharmacology 
uh, will assess pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics properties in human and clinical studies, uh, which are basically clinical trials to show efficacy and safety of the product. So here, basically, if we uh, look at the requirements of WHO, EMA, and FDA, basically they are the same concerning the tests for quality, non-clinical studies, and clinical studies with a few uh, difference and details between them. But basically, they are uh, the same. And we have to remember that uh, the biosimilar development will rely on head-to-head -head comparison of the biosimilar and the reference uh, drug in order to show that there is no difference between the biosimilar and the reference product, and in case it shows to have some differences at any level, at this time the product won't be qualified as, bio, as a biosimilar. In the regulatory requirements, it's very important to focus on immunogenicity requirements because it's essential in biotherapeutic products. What is immunogenicity? Now, unlike uh, the chemical product, immunogenicity is a key consideration in uh, biotherapeutic uh, products, and it should be tested. At its end, it is included in all regulations, EMA, FDA, WHO. This is a major concern, and in immunogenicity, you see that uh, there, is, uh, there are antibodies directed against the biological medicine, which is very dangerous but because it might create resistance and non-response for very critical patients in chronic conditions. Immunogenicity can only be assessed via clinical safety data in the relevant patient populations. And even uh, the WHO uh, guidelines have specified um, uh, the uh, biosimilar as a product uh, that have shown to be similar and the immunogenicity is also the same. Uh, it's not different, even if uh, the safety and the efficacy are proven, but if immunogenicity is different, then the product won't be qualified as a biosimilar. Noting that there are several factors that might influence the immunogenicity, uh, uh, starting with the gene incorporation, purification methods, cell culture media and conditions, even the packaging and the formulation might also influence the immunogenicity. So pre-authorization immunogenicity has to be tested and presented to uh, regulators. Now, it's very important to mention that biosimilars are not biomimics, biogenerics, uh, non-comparables, NTBs, non-regulated biologics, because these terms are used for copies uh, that didn't uh, follow the regulatory pathway we have discussed before. And as per the WHO recommendations, any product that uh, hadn't undergone uh, those, uh, this pathway of regulatory uh, and uh, presented all the documentation won't be considered as biosimilar. And the biosimilars have to prove to be non-inferior and non-superior uh, to uh, the reference product if uh, they show to be superior. Uh, so at this time, they will be considered to be biobatteries or biosuperior. Uh, what, what, what are biobatteries and biosuperiors? So those are biologics with improved properties. And here, uh, this, this pathway will require uh, the pathway of an, origina an originator for regulatory approval. And if we look at benefits and risks of biosimilars from a reimbursement point of view, uh, I can tell you that uh, good quality biosimilars uh, are well perceived by payers because they are uh, mostly cost saving and they will increase the access of uh, those important drugs to a, a bigger number of patients we have. But, we, uh, but I guess uh, uh, payers are afraid of the risk, safety, um, immunogenicity and unknown risk, specifically that any uh, risk or any adverse event uh, will really have a very uh, high for, uh, financial impact uh, on at the payers level. I really hope the presentation was clear uh, and that I didn't exceed the time allowed to me. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mirna.
Um, I guess we may proceed uh, with Dr. Fadi. Fadi, you are uh, muted. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Yes, we, we may leave the discussion till the end of uh, presentation of Dr. Fadi, all right? Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I, I would like to thank you, or to thank all the speakers, panelists, and all the attendees. Very nice uh, subject and uh, accurate for us. Uh, my talk is about biosimilars in hematology, real world data, and local experience. So, uh, what's, what's my, my biggest fear? What's the biggest fear of any doctor? Indeed, it's the, 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 uh, uh, it's really the, the medical error. And why you should know what is it. This is a really problem, our field. It is the Hippocratic Oath. Yes, that's what we are, fear, we are fearing because we are prescribing regimen for the good of patients. That's our duty and we have to do it and we have to give our proper judgment. So we are not obliged to do everything is said to us. We have to really intervent. When the quality problem started to be important for us, because as you know, when you are working in or studying in Europe, in North America or other countries, uh, it, it, it will not be your problem. It's the problem of the payers there. But in Lebanon, I remember the first time uh, I, I was obliged to think about that. It was in 2007 when I used to give a rituximab uh, uh, brand the drug without any complications, any hypersensitivity, any reaction. So we ask ourselves, is it really uh, the good one? And we send it to Basel, and uh, it was really, as you can see, the vials do not contain rituximab, which is the active ingredient. So yes, it was uh, really uh, uh, unacceptable. So it was the fear for me. I could ignore the problem, I could uh, run away from it or uh, start and, and facing this, this uh, big issue. And when I start searching, I saw that the problem of substandard drugs that it was presented by Dr. Ala Alwan is a global problem. It's not concerning only third world, as you can see even in USA, in, in uh, European community, community uh, there is a lot of problems uh, concerning the substandard drugs, the faked drugs. And I, I went to look to our region, what about the Middle Eastern countries? Uh, what, what are the challenges? We know that Um, I, I don't hear you, Dr. Farhat. I guess uh, there is a technical problem. Um, Dr. Hennad. Yes, I don't hear him. Ah, so it is a, a problem it's for- a technical uh, problem. Us, I, I guess. Um, I guess maybe uh, he is uh, disconnected, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Farhat. Yes. Um, you can see just... some questions, Dr. Ahmad. Yes, yes, Dr. exactly, Hennig. exactly. Yes. So have uh, Dr. Farhat back. Yes, exactly. Uh, I just, I just uh, read a question regarding the uh, biosimilar, uh, whether it may overcome a resistance of a drug. Um, I'm not sure if I under I I understood the question uh, clearly. Um, Maybe he is asking if we give a biosimilar drug, 
we can overcome a resistance of the original drug. I, I don't think so because the biosimilar is supposed to be um, very similar to the original uh, drug and we cannot, uh, of course, overcome a resistance for an even it's not indicated to give it uh, any more. Maybe there is a, a little bit misunderstanding uh, regarding the difference between uh, the generic and a biosimilar drug. Uh, in simple words, I guess we can define biosimilar drugs so that it is a more complex uh, than the generic, you know, the uh, demonstration uh, should be uh, with high similarity and safety, quality, and uh, efficacy. The biosimilar is a biological product. Uh, and even regarding the, the uh, development time, it's, uh, it takes more time than a generic. For example, the generic drug may take about two to three years, whereas the biosimilar drug may take uh, more than uh, eight to ten uh, years. And of course, it costs, it, it costs more. Uh, for example, the cost of a uh, generic uh, drug may take two to five million dollars, whereas the de development cost of a biosimilar it is between uh, 100 and 200 million dollars. And we all know that uh, we need a study proving the safety and efficacy of the biosimilar drug, whereas the uh, 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 generic drug, we don't need uh, a study for for that. Um, Dr. Hennett, uh, you picked out some questions from the audience. Uh, no, uh, uh, for, um, for the first question, I, I totally agree with you. Biosimilars are normally indicated in the same uh, uh, indications of the reference product. So uh, uh, for the, the indications, it's uh, the same uh, product label for each country. So uh, it's not for overcoming resistance, it's for the same in indications. And yes. the concept of extrapolations that Dr. Abdullah, as Dr. Abdullah said, is very, is unique uh, to biosimilars. So for biosimilars, it, the clinical study is done only in one indication and we, ex and, uh, we extrapolate, but the extrapolation <clears throat> uh, is based on the mechanism of action that must be the same in all the indications and also on the safety profile that must be the same in all the indications and the pharmacokinetic profile that must be the same in the same in the, in the old indication and if we have all these um, all these results we can say that the bio, we can extrapolate the indication but it's not for overcoming uh, the resistance and as you said for generics we don't need a clinical uh, study uh, it's uh, only for biosimilars. It's important to have a phase one clinical trial for the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile and one comparative uh, study to the reference products. And because bi uh, biosimilars are biological products and it's also important to understand that a monoclonal antibody, even if they are reference product, may be different from one country to another. For example, all the biosimilar, all the monoclonal antibodies that we know are different between Europe and the United States and US, for example. For example, if we uh, Dr. Dr. Hened, um, some of the audience told, uh, just wrote that sound is not heard. We just ah, okay. need to ask the Science Pro that everything is fine uh, with the audience. Do you hear me? Yes, Did yes, the sound is perfectly well. I hear you. Uh, and even with audience, not our, not only our the the, the all panelists, you know, we okay. just uh, need to be sure that all is uh, hearing what what we are talking about. Okay. No, everyone is hearing. There is a problem, maybe Great. at there, and Thank no problem. You. We have with us Thank Dr. You. Fadi Alies. She wants to ask yes. a question uh, before coming back to Dr. Farhad. Dr. Alies, please. Uh, good afternoon. I would like uh, to make a comment. Uh, because you already mentioned that uh, using uh, substandard drugs is not always associated with a decrease in uh, treatment costs. And uh, as Dr. Alwan uh, uh, 
uh, talked about uh, the CML as an example, uh, I would like to share with you a study that we published last year about uh, budget impact of uh, treatment free remission in treating the CML. And uh, in this study, uh, out of uh, 162 patients uh, treated for CML, 83% uh, were eligible to stop treatment. And, uh, and we, uh, after a, four years, we can reduce the total cost of CML treatment by 57%. And in this case, we use the only uh, the original uh, drugs like uh, imatinib uh, and uh, bezantinib and uh, nilotinib. So my okay. comment is that uh, even with uh, original drugs uh, and after a good follow-up, uh, we can save uh, money in terms of uh, treatment cost. Yes, th thank you, Fadia, for this comment. Uh, definitely, uh, there are some very good generic drugs uh, and we can uh, even use safely, but uh, I guess Dr. Alwan mentioned the substandard uh, drug, which yes, is yes. Uh, uh, not I mean, approved not and, uh, and make a detrimental uh, effect on, uh, on our patient uh, safety and, uh, you know, uh, follow-up. Uh, thank you, Fadia, for, for sharing this uh, information. Uh, and I guess we may proceed with uh, Dr. Fadia, you are with us again, yeah? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. For the uh, please, please, Fadia, yes. Continue, so, uh, please. thank you for the comments of uh, Dr. Fadia Lies and for others. Just I was uh, saying that I tried uh, from our region uh, to, uh, to study the, the problem and I took Lebanon as a middle income country. And here, the study, uh, the study mentioned by Dr., uh, another study by Dr. Afadi Aliyez, who was responsible of the governmental, uh, the Wazat al Saha, the Ministry of Health Committee. And very nice in the study, it shows how, with time, we had an increase of the, of the payment of the cost of uh, drugs. As you can see, from 2008 up to uh, 2016, three times more, from 17 to 52 percent. And another also uh, a nice table by Dr. Afadi Elias and colleagues, it shows the increasing financial impact of newer cancer drug and in Lebanon. And you can see that uh, monoclonal antibodies and it's uh, so biosimilars are the, 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 the similar to monoclonal antibodies took really the majority of the budget. Look for trastuzumab from 2009 2015, and then after you can look to the bifazuzumab and rituximab. So yes, yes, uh, the, the 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 biggest impact, uh, the biggest impact is really the monoclonal antibody, and you can see here that the 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 cost increased from seven thousand to eight four hundred. Uh, on two years in, 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 in countries like developed countries. And in some countries, uh, the, the, in, in Lebanon, for example, uh, the payment was that our role as per ASCO is really to provide the good quality, the highest quality for our patient. Also as per OT, uh, 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 for, uh, the, 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 our, our, uh, uh, also we have to give the safest drug, but we have to take in consideration the cost effectiveness, like the position uh, uh, paper by ESMO. So it's a quality, it's safety, it's cost effectiveness. No, uh, knowing that our patients deserve the best available treatment that we can afford for sure, we have to think of cost reduction. It's very important. No, still, efficacy and safety should be uh, the, 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 the first uh, uh, of first rank importance for us. And it was said, I will repeat it again, when we talk about small molecules, small molecules, 
uh, like uh, uh, like the the uh, the brand generic small molecules it's low molecule chemical synthesis manufacture is easy it's an identical copy of active ingredient but biosimilar is totally different as it was shown by dr uh, Muhammad Abdullah by Dr. Amir Namatni. It's high molecular weight. It's like a plane compared to a bicycle. It's produced by living organism. That's why we talk about immunogenicity. It's manufacturing, the manufacturing process is really complicated. That's why Dr. Muhammad Abdullah said that he trusted, uh, he trusts more the big company, while Dr. Amir Namatni and myself are saying that we accept whenever the pathway is well followed. And it requires, uh, it requires a, an important uh, issue. So I was interested by uh, this problem and I started, I started studying this problem. And we have uh, the, the opportunity to publish at this time a paper about the concept of biosimilar from characterization to evolution. It was a review uh, published in 2017 and in the, we talked about the small and biological molecules, big molecules, and we said how important, uh, how important is the bioequivalence uh, for the small molecules, and that was that was uh, there was no clinical data required, and that we could refer to the originary or originated. And while with biosimilar biological, uh, the the the, the, the um, we have to do analysis for the biological drug. And we have to study the immunogenicity as it was shown by Dr. Amir Namatni also. And this made the difference between these molecules. And again, it should be similar by structure, function, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic. Why we are repeating that in three different talks? Because it's very important. It's similar, it's not equal, it's not generic for the brand, it's bio antibodies or any bio living so we need again to study and have the similar structure function pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamics we have to prove the dr fedji we don't hear you very well the same the development for generics is and uh, now now yeah. you there is a problem. There is a problem with the voice, uh, Dr. Fadi. Uh -oh. <clears throat> okay. So now, now is now is it's better. It's good. So uh, I, I I will go back. No, there is a we, we don't hear you. We start. We we we. So that I will, I will go rapidly through the slides just to فادي هلا انا سامعكم اه وهلا سمعناه كثير منيح اذا بتكفي هيك جريت دكتور فرحات اي ويل تراي تو شير ذا سلايدز فروم ماي سايد ميبي ذا كونكشن وود بي بيتر ار يو وذ اس يس يس ايم دو يو هير مي يس اوكي ايم شيرينج ذا سلايدز ناو uh, maybe if you can stop the cam as well, so the connection would be better. Yes, okay. 
So I was telling that the development of generics is totally different. It's less costly and it less, uh, and it, it, it uh, can I have my slide or not? I'm sharing the slides right now. You can see them. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Farhat, we can hear you very well. I'm sharing my screen now and I have, I shared your slides. Okay, so development of biosimilars uh, is really similar to the originator more than to generics. It's, it's uh, costly, we have to repeat studies and as you can see here, uh, the cost is 100 million when it's for reference 800 uh, million and it's two, three millions for genetics. I will not go through that, the most important we did later on another paper, the second paper on biosimilar, and we tried to collect from the Arab countries and Iran in one of our Congress, uh, some data about, about uh, uh, biosimilar, and we had 117 that answered. And about the knowledge we have, yes, 66% news, new, new news about it, and they said that the main issue is lower, lower price. The main advantage is the lower, lower price. So 60% consider the price that the main uh, important uh, benefit from biosimilars. Uh, uh, then we, I started also thinking that uh, the role of, 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 uh, of all stakeholders, of all healthcare providers, is here to help the patient. It's not only the pharmacist, it's also the insurers, it's the, the uh, the, 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 the government, the doctors, the nurses, etc., even the media. So I started involved and more involved, and that's how I, I have been developing my activity, uh, studying the biosimilar, the biocopy, the generics, the brand, and the substandard treatment. And uh, then uh, we, I started to realize that we have in Lebanon some biocopies I rejected, and we have some biosimilars. And one of these, I will give an example since I have to talk about our experience and the real world data. We had the Rigzatone, which was implemented recently, and uh, Rigzatone is a rituximab biosimilar. And this drug uh, showed, uh, showed really a, 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 an importance because it helps us uh, to sustain the economic burden uh, that is coming with our more survival person and with more incident and with more treatment. And uh, this drug also went through all the, uh, the, the, the uh, procedure that should be done. The totality of evidence was here and Rigzatone uh, went through all the, uh, the, the manufacturing process and also is now under post-marketing studies. And this drug also um, uh, showed all the, the totality of evidence for biosimilar similarity. And when we talk about such a trial, remember again that biosimilar need the trials to be confirmed. So I go back to say to Dr. Rahend, if, you, if she's still with us, I will ask any, uh, anyone, if, if it's not FDA or, or EMA approved, probably to run the trial in my country. And then after I will take this biosimilar or I'll take it if it's run in a good country. And here, Rigzatone, it's a study uh, that was run comparing the uh, biosimilar rigzatone th to the originator and uh, till maintenance in follicular lymphoma. The, the, uh, the, um, the main uh, objective was to compare the efficacy and safety and the end point was the overall response uh, rate. And as you can see, the safety end point was adverse event and immunogenicity. We talked a lot about immunogenicity. And here you can see in both uh, uh, in, the, in this schema that uh, the efficacy was equal when we talk about efficacy clinical, it was equal. When we talk about the tolerability, you see that it was good in, in both Rigzatone and the uh, originator. And you can see that the frequency of reported adverse event was the same in both. And immunogenicity was low in both. And what's important when we talk about immunogenicity is neutralizing anti-drug antibodies. We had only 0.7%, which is acceptable in general, and that in both. So Rigzatone also has real-world evidence. So as you can see, this drug is not only conducting, uh, was not uh, already proven only in phase three, but also in, in post, uh, 
uh, in real world in phase four. So Rigzatone Onco tracked one of the of this trial that started in July two thousand seventeen. Uh, used first uh, 71 physician, 23 centers, and 17,700 17, uh, patients that uh, had non-Hodgkin lymphoma from CLL, follicular, diffuse bilar cell, and other NHL. And remember what was said by my previous colleague, here we extrapolated the indication because the trial was only on FL, follicular lymphoma. No, it's allowed in some cases to extrapolate the indication and in this trial, 51% of the cases were extrapolated. So, as you can see, we have equal uh, arms uh, uh, rituximab or reference drug in, in the diffuse large cell and CLL. And uh, the biosimilars uh, uh, usage was initially 12%. So, when we started the trial, only 12% received the biosimilar. But with time, we observed that many received the, uh, the, the biosimilar, up to 88%, which is translate in seven time increasing of the use, and which means that there, was, there has been a higher acceptance of biosimilar. So you understand well when you try, you will not go and try it again. This increase in the, in the, in the percentage means that there's higher ex acceptance from the uh, doctors and, and the uh, patients, and even an extrapolated indication. Another trial was reflect, and it's still ongoing, and the duration is for 12 months, but the most important that uh, this trial also include uh, the, the rigzatone uh, with, the, with the CHOP trial in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and again, without going into detail, you can see that the adverse event and uh, the, 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 um, uh, uh, the, re the, the reaction were the same as expected for rituximab uh, original drug. So there was no difference in the safety of medication. And it's very important for us not to harm our patient while giving the same efficacy. So Rigzatone offers superior, and it was amazing because Rigzatone offers superior stability data comparing with the reference medicine. And again, I will raise this, uh, this discussion with my colleagues. You know that the, 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 the biosimilar is a different drug, so it might be even higher, a little higher, more higher efficacy or a little less uh, efficacy. So it also might be different stability because it's not the same molecule, it's different molecule similar. So you can see here that the Rigzatone has a higher stability uh, than the uh, rituximab originated. And it's very important uh, to mention that. So uh, personally, I think that Rigzatone has really uh, uh, brought us uh, uh, a new option. And Rigzatone uh, is, is, uh, is, 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 has proved its efficacy and safety. And it will help us uh, uh, maintaining, maintain our, our budget, help us. And, Remember that Rigzatone is a Sandoz product. Was I'm, what, what, why I'm telling that? Because really Sandoz is now a very, um, very disseminated uh, company, as you can see almost everywhere. And uh, uh, you have to look to the uh, history of, of Sandoz because it's 70 years of biotechnology expertise. You remember that Novartis before was Sandoz and, and uh, it, was, it, it, it was merged with another company. So, they are a pioneer because they have over 500 million with experience, a lot of biological approved in Lebanon, and we will see it later on, and they are available in 100 countries. And look, a lot of these products are, you, are used in our country nowadays in oncology and in rheumatology, which, which is very important and give us many confidence. And I want to remind you that the first studies were done by Sandoz. Uh, on biosimilar, and it was a smart from Novartis to, to 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 keep Sandoz. It's not like other companies where they they, they cancelled the previous company. Novartis decided to be for the origin originator and Sandoz for biosimilars and generics. And the first development was in '96. It took 10 years. It took 10 years uh, till having the approval of the first biosimilar worldwide. It was the somato the somatropine. And then after we had another, the protein alpha, 
others and others. And so you can see that it's very rich, a uh, very rich, uh, very rich uh, bagage for uh, Sandoz in the biosimilars. And uh, uh, here I will go to my take home message. I will repeat the message from ASCO about the highest quality for our patients about, and also for the ESMO about the safety and the cost effectiveness used of cancer drug. So we have to treat our patients, but we have to treat them with good quality, safe, uh, safe drugs and cost effective drugs. And if you prescribe biosimilar when you can, or when you, it's affordable, it's if, if you can afford the, 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 the brand, go for it, the originator, go for it. But if you have economical problem and you prescribe biosimilar, your patient, patients will have more access for effective drug access and effectiveness. And also the pharmacist will have the possibility to get other biologics, not only the reference to the drug, and he can manage better the budget and the doctor will be sure if it's a biosimilar uh, studied and approved, it, it's a high quality, again, quality. It's cost effective, so again, cost effectiveness with the reassurance that the uh, quality, the efficacy is equivalent. So yes, the clinicians can be sure that it's a high quality. And my last slide will be to say the bylaws can really make a big save, uh, a big economy in our budget, as you can see here in the slide. So with that, I thank you very much, and I hope we will have a very hot, again, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Farhat. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Farhat and uh, Dr. Mirna Metni for this uh, very uh, nice comprehensive uh, presentations. Uh, we may, uh, actually we have uh, one question from the audience. If we uh, may answer, then we proceed with uh, uh, further discussion. Uh, from Walid Al Morsi, what is the difference between biosimilars and intended uh, copies? Um, any, anyone will take this question, or I may answer. Uh, you can answer. Not sure. Uh, yeah, Mirna, you want to take it, or I answer? Actually, no um, yeah, I yeah, the, yeah, yes, please, Mirna. Yeah, so as we have discussed before, that uh, the naming of intended copies are, are not real biosimilars because as we have discussed, biosimilars uh, have to follow the regulatory pathway in order to demonstrate the clinical and non-clinical uh, similar efficacy uh, versus the uh, reference product and the immunogenicity uh, data, as well as the analytical testing. So if the product, the biologic product, had not undergone all this regulatory pathway, at this time we will call it uh, the non-comparable biologics or whatever the nominations we have for the biomimics or in yes. terms of copies. Thank you, thank you. Um, I have a question to all the panelists actually uh, based on Dr. Farhat uh, survey. Uh, many of the doctors uh, answered that uh, the cost is the most important issue regarding uh, biosimilars. And we all know that uh, generic drugs uh, may be much uh, cheaper than uh, uh, than uh, the original, but biosimilar because of its co complexity and cost and uh, trial and so on, uh, we don't know the margin of, of decreasing the, the cost. Uh, my question to all the panelists uh, uh, for biosimilar drug, what uh, do you think the, the fair cost percentage of discount uh, compared to the original drug? It is, is it 80, 90, 70, 60, or less percent from the original drug? I think now that, that this, the, the savings are about 30%. It's 30% uh, less than the reference product. So it's the price that we have now, I think. I don't know if yeah. Dr. So Rina wants to. So it is 70%. Uh, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 less. So 30 less. 30 less. Yeah. So it is 30 70 less. Of the, of the original yes. drug. Yes, yes. Oh, 30 per, yeah. 
so like Dr. Hind was saying, worldwide, whenever they assessed the difference in pricing, it was like 25 to 30 percent worldwide, which is a big difference. In fact, as for, for example, Lebanon, because even generics by law are 30 percent less than the chemical originator. But uh, in Europe, basically, the generics are much lower, so they can reach like 50 to 60 percent less than the branding. So that's why 25 to 30 is not considered oh. that uh, a, a, a huge decrease in some uh, areas. Uh, excuse me, when we go back to the FDA, I am Mohammed Abdullah, but I don't, I don't know why they stop my video, but uh, when uh, uh, we go back to the FDA and the estimated uh, prices, usually they estimate that the biosimilar should not be less than 30% from the price of the originator. Because, again, we need a quality of the manufacturer. It is not an easy yes. job. So, okay. so at least... At least uh, I will, I will give this kind and a very similar with 10% uh, of the uh, originator. But this is not uh, real life. We are talking about utopia. I have one question also to uh, the panelists and uh, all the speakers. Uh, do you tell systematically the patient, do you inform, inform him that you are uh, prescribing a biosimilar rather than a reference product? When you give him, for example, bevacizumab or uh, trastuzumab or rituximab, do you tell him it's a biosimilar that I will give you? Do you systematically inform him or not? Let me answer. Uh, Fadi very Farhad. nice, very nice question. Uh, personally, I uh, I'm not sure when I give the biosimilar since I am uh, really comfortable with. Uh, I I don't do it because uh, I think it will it will create for him a some some uh, uh, some uh, problem de confiance. Some, yes. Uh, this may raise an ethical issue, Fadi. Yes. Ma, ma yes. 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 Ethics, ma Zamirna may tell us uh, ethically, should we tell the patient that it is a biosimilar and not the original drug, or we may avoid this? If well, he doesn't ask. It, uh, yes. Now, uh, first, if, if there's no switching, so basically it's a new prescription. It's not the switching. Yes, it's a new basically prescription. A new prescription, and the product is EMA or FDA approved, and it's a biosimilar. So ethically, if the patient does not ask the question, so basically the doctor can do it because he's pretty sure that the product is good, as well as it's exactly the story of the generics. So whenever we prescribe a good generic, usually the doctor won't tell, uh, tell the, um, uh, the patient. But the problem, the ethical problem is in the switching. switching. So it's, uh, it's in the switching uh, or, uh, or as we say, substitution by the physician and switching by the pharmacist. So here is the issue because surely the a patient must be informed even if it's a very good product because we have issues in switching. Can I comment, Dr. Yunus, yes. Dr. Rapti? Also, I wanted to say that you know that in Europe and USA, you are not you have to write the generic name, so uh, you don't try the the brand name. And it was a big problem to track uh, the, the the toxicities in this case. So that's why in some countries they ask what name. So if you are allowed to prescribe the generic name, it means you are not obliged when it's a new prescription. But uh, since I am confident with that, I'm trying to give my patient the best. There is no ethical issue. I'm prescribing the drug and I agree if you switch. The only time when I tell the patient is when he has a, a bio copy or, uh, or uh, in my opinion, a substandard drug. Then I tell him that I am not confident with this drug. I cannot use it. And here I think that I'm right to do that because it's my obligation to do that. Okay, thank you. I think that the, the, the most important thing is to distinguish between switching and automatic substitution because yeah. switching is at the physician level. So he's the one who will make this decision. So when he knows the biosimilar, there is no problem. As you said, Dr. Yeah. Fadi, when you, know, when you know the rituximab biosimilar, you can prescribe it because you are confident. 
the automatic substitution is different is as the pharmacist level and what is the, when it's the pharmacist it's, normally it's not it's not allowed it's not good to have the automatic substitution in the in the regulation it's better to have the switching that can be done by the physician but the automatic substitution is is in general not allowed uh, in general uh, uh, i think we should distinguish between the private patient who yes. are treating in the private sector and the people who are uh, treated in the governmental institution. Uh, usually in the private sector, always they ask because they are willing to pay. Uh, this is my comment. Uh, I think Dr. Um. and Fadi all they are agree with me. The second thing, Dr. Abdullah, uh, uh, all uh, we agreed that we have 30% uh, less in the generic, uh, in the generic products. Why we don't apply the companies to do the same that zero? The reduction is from 50 to 60 percent from the original product. Sorry, Dr. Sami. Uh, why we don't apply the pharma company to reduce the price as they are doing in Europe? from 30% to be 50 to 60%. Uh, uh, let me tell you, Dr. Sarvi, that in Egypt we have uh, more early than other countries because of the economic status of the country in general. And they are seeking to increase their uh, contribution in the market because, as you know, we are about more than 100 millions. Okay. Uh, we do have and access to the PSP earlier than other uh, smaller countries regarding the size of the population. Um, but if you ask me about the, uh, if I have a patient, as the last question, if I have a patient, who am I going to do? I am going to tell him that we are going to receive the biosimilar for the uh, originator. Um, so far, I am convinced generator is similar and fitting the criteria. Here we go back to the questions uh, stated earlier in our meeting today about uh, uh, biosimilars not passing through the EMEA or the FDA approvals. Here I think uh, the, the, the question answer was answered clearly now. There is no place for Asians or biosimilar or biosimilars not passing through the regulatory conventional regulatory issues. Okay. Um, if we have the approval, I think there is no matter to tell the patient this is a biosimilar or the originator. But if I have a biosimilar coming from other country, where I'm sure and you are sure following the roles for this. It will be unethical to, 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 to not to, uh, to tell your patients. Well, uh, this may raise a question here. Uh, uh, who thinks that uh, there should be a post-marketing uh, trial in order to, to, to prove a more efficacy and safety for uh, biosimilars? If you are going to follow the same guidelines for a clinical trial conduction as that were done for the biosimilars initially, it's okay. And I think we need uh, to be more firm and strict on the conduction of clinical trials. It should cover a bigger number of patients, be under good control, and so uh, Dr. Fadi, the floor is yours because we are too late. We are too late. Still, I would like to give the, the, the floor, the, 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 uh, the la parole uh, for Dr. Bahrani. Are you still with us? Yes, Dr. Fadi, with you. Yes, yes. Please, yes, uh, yes. yes. Just to correct a uh, few, few points. First of all, we need to distinguish. We don't have branded 100%. 
because by definition, biosimilars means the drug whose has been produced for the first times. Once you go and produce it in another factory, it becomes biosimilar, even if it's branded, because you cannot copy it 100%. This is one. Second thing, they are very good com uh, companies who are uh, doing biosimilars. We have, uh, in Oman, we have very good experience with them, with no issues. We, ha we have used it to negotiate pricing with the original companies, and we manage, for example, with Herceptin, for example, for Roche to match the price of biosimilars. So if you use pharma uh, economic or someone with a good negotiation, you can bring biosimilar and you can negotiate with the original company and we managed to do it with uh, with Roche. Uh, very good, okay. Dr. Basil. Okay, thank you, thank and you all, can thank you. Can I challenge you with one question? Dr. Elen, she's the panelist. Yes, I yes. am from the insurance field and since the biosimilars will bring us some uh, cost reduction, and our insurance companies are interested to make a profit. If uh, in the insurance policy, they make some incentives, incentives to people, maybe the patient or his attending physician to choose the cheaper uh, drug. Will it, uh, how will, this will influence your choice? Uh, will uh, you go uh, and uh, trust these bio, uh, biosimilars or you, uh, you will challenge us and uh, maybe tell the patient this is not uh, correct. You, you, you understand what I mean? If in the policy, the, we sell to our patient. We tell them if you go, if your doctor prescribe a brand drug, you will pay some excess. If he will uh, choose a similar drug, biosimilar drug, which is less expensive, you will not pay any excess. So he will push you to choose the less expensive. And what will be your position in this case? As doctors, as oncologists, I mean. Who wants to answer? It's a, it's a, it's a very provocative question. <laughs> in Morocco, it's already uh, like that. Uh, for uh, if for, if for uh, reimbursement, they are reimbursed on the basis of the price of the biosimilar. For the biosimilars that are already approved, we have biosimilars for, for bevacizumab, trastuzumab, and rituximab, and the reimbursement is based on the price of biosimilars. So, okay, Dr. Hende, if you tell your, if you told your patient that the biosimilar and the originator are the same and they must the same again, they must the same steps of approval, definitely he's going to the to to to, uh, to go for the cheaper one, provided that he's not going. To. Yes. So it's our turn from the start yes. to be convinced that they are the same. Yes. If we are confident with the biosimilar, we must be convinced that they provide the same results, the same safety, the same efficacy. And if it is not and FDA or EMA approval, approval. Well, no, they I am talking about um, the guidelines, not only FDA approved yes. or uh, EMA approved. I'm Listen. talking about my country. If they are approved in my country as biosimilars, if they follow the steps uh, and the regulatory pathway, and I am confident with them, yes. Yeah. Just, and to, just, uh, Ilan, just, just to, to add please. one thing. Yeah. Go ahead, Milna, go ahead, please. Yeah, just to add one thing. Yeah. Hi, hello, Dr. Ilan. Uh, uh, if you want to take the experience on Dr. Okay. Hennet in the country, if just you pay on the lowest price of the all available biosimilars, so you keep the choice for the physician yes. in order to decide what to prescribe, and you pay on the uh, uh, lowest okay. pricing, and this also will keep the uh, will keep the, the choice for the physician for the out of pocket what to pay. Yes, we how have can the you choice. Be, uh, and how you are, how how you are being confident with the agent itself, just through the regulatory. Uh, steps or if it is not FDA and the EMA you are Let's, going uh, to ask uh, for uh, clinical trial. Dr. Muhammad Abdullah, Dr. Muhammad Abdullah, Anna, what I think really to go back to the question of Dr. Elan, first you, we have to remember that every country has its own uh, rules and regulatory pathways. So for example, I will ask Dr. Uh, Sami Khatib, I think that Patency, for example, in Jordan is only accepted for three years. 
after three years, they can use any, any competitor as a generic. Remember the term generic, it means that the drug is approved in the country. It might be substandard, but named generic. So we have to, 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 to understand that first. Second, the biosimilar is a drug that, has, that went through all pathway and is similar. So it might be a, a, a approved even if it's not really equivalent in a country. So in this case, we cannot go against that. It's every country and its rules. So let's not, we are talking about quality in general. Going back to Dr. Elaine, biosimilars are now, I can show it in the slide, if you look, for example, for a follicular lymphoma, you will find the name as reference of some biosimilars. So, for example, Rigzutan is, 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 is written in the guidelines. So, yes, when is a biosimilar, it's, it's, I like the comment of Dr. Basim Bahrani. That why I, that's why I give him all the, the la parole. The, he, he says all these interesting things. The biosimilar is a new brand. It's a new molecule similar to the old one. So when it's biosimilar, you can, you can use it, Dr. Elaine, and the doctor can use it. But here it's, a, it's, it's your issue as insurance. So you can do like the cars. So if you do less accident, you pay less the next year. So if you use less drug, you pay less the next year. But a very nice uh, suggestion by Dr. Amir Namitni, you put the th threshold on the lowest price, and then after, if, he, if the patients want the originator, originator, he can pay an extra, but acceptable extra. So you see, you see to, to close the session, we went a lot more. Just than one comment. Time. Just one yeah, comment. Ahead, Just one comment. Just one comment, and I will, I will, I will, I will close my mouth thereafter. No, no. <laughs> I'm not against. I'm not against the biosimilar. I'm not against the cheaper drugs. We are all in the Arab world, and we know, we know that we need to utilize our resources in a better way. But I don't have the the the, the opportunity. Suggest that this biosimilar, it's a biosimilar by definition. Please come to, 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 to real life. Is it like the originator? We do have biosimilars now. We know that it's good and it's it, it nearly identical. Originator. Okay, I will go through and use it. When I have something, I didn't try it. I didn't use it before. And nobody in the country say yes. You know that the process of approvals itself and testing, it's papers and some laboratory uh, investigations or tests for the molecule, not for everything. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm re I don't feel um, or, or, or be uh, enthusiastic to use such Asians without a real, real data about its value. Okay, the only all, way through the through the regions. We we all agree. We all agree with you that it's uh, really the best way uh, to be confident. The best way is to go through uh, again FDA and EMA rules, and that's what we are doing all the time. No, we cannot oblige any country to follow the rules of others, we cannot yes. state them, but we are here to talk science. And for the time being, for, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the FDA and the EMA are the references for us. So that's why we, you, you are asking for, for that. That's so why we are accepting. Just to talk in science, we are angels and we are in utopia. But we, cannot, we cannot oblige India, uh, who has more than one million person, to follow the rules otherwise. It's their problem. So with yes, that, it's not mine. With, the, with that, Fratt, we Fratt, I didn't specify in the... Yes, yes. Dr. Dr. Fratt, 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 just a quick, uh, sorry, quick comment. Most of the buyers similar yeah. have FDA approval, by the way. Okay. So why we are struggling? So for example, <laughs> uh, Azutumab, there are at least four or five companies with five FDA approval, or Tuximab, and so most of the buyers similar has an FDA approval. Excellent. Welcome. Excellent. Most welcome. Excellent. The, the aim of the session was to familiarize every, uh, all the audience about the biosimilar. We are living in a region 
with a lot of, of, of cost uh, obstacles and, and we have to overcome that by uh, doing an equilibrium between the quality and the cost. So that's the role of iSport, Dr. Amir Namatni. That's our role as physicians and that's the role of pharmacists and that's the role of insurers. We have to raise the communication and the discussion about these and we understand that our insurers should continue paying so we would help them but we don't want to use substandard drug. I go back to Ala Alwan. No substandard, no less quality. We need a good quality when affordable. Thank you very much. With that, I, I, uh, I, 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 I will leave the floor. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Inshallah. See you next time, inshallah. Salam alaikum. Dr. Basim, thank you for your comments. Okay.